Hello, in this video, I'm going to show you how to create a spectral freeze effect using Max MSP. This effect takes an audio signal, it performs a fast Fourier transform on it, giving us the frequencies and uh, spectral profile and the phase of the sound, which we then save into a jitter matrix and read it back using an inverse fast Fourier transform. Doing all this lets us freeze the sound in time and lets us freeze the playback of the spectral analysis that we have done, giving us all kinds of different cool soundscapes and instrumental effects and compositional techniques, which you can then use to create all kinds of creative and interesting audio stuff. Let's see how this is possible. All right, I'm going to start by setting up an audio playback system. So I'm going to be using the classic Anton.AIF. I'm going to create live.gain tilde for that sweet, sweet gain scaling. I'm going to use Limi tilde with the argument two, even though I know this is not going to clip, just to be sure, just to have some peace of mind. And then I'm going to create easy deck for the final step so that the sound can reach my ears. And it is going to sound something like this. All right, so now to build my spectral freeze uh, patch, I need to do two, two things. I need to first record the spectral profile of the sound. And then after it's recorded, I need to play back the spectral profile, profile of the sound at a given point. All right, so I want to be able to say, all right, I have the spectral analysis and just play the middle of the sound, play the frequencies that are present at that millisecond or at that grouping of samples, which should give us a nice spectral freeze effect and playback, which we can then use for soundscapes and all kinds of other cool applications. But I'm getting ahead of myself because we have to focus on the first part, recording the spectral profile of the sound. For this, we are going to be using the PFFT tilde object, which is, as it says, a spectral processing manager for patchers. So if I just create this object, well, it's not going to work. I think it's even going to throw me an error. Yep, requires patcher name argument. Now, this will happen because PFFT, like Poly, uh, or even Gen, JitGen, and JitGLPix, it needs to refer to another patcher. In the case of Gen, I can just lock the patch and double click on it to bring up the uh, the gen sub patcher. But in the case of PFFT, I actually need to create a new patcher and I need to save this patcher and then I need to give PFFT the name of the saved patcher as the first argument. So I'm just going to keep this empty for now. I'm going to try to save it. As you can see from a previous recording attempt, I already have hg underscore FFT record that max uh, So I'm just going to overwrite that file. So now this patcher is hg underscore FFT record, which means since it is in the same folder as my main spectral freeze patcher, I can just give it as a first argument hg underscore FFT record. And it is going to work. And when I lock the patch, and when I double click on PFFT, it is actually going to open the same hg underscore FFT record. All right, so what we are doing and what PFFT does is fast Fourier transform. Now, this is a fairly complicated subject, especially if you want to get into the nitty gritty mathematical details of it. But for us musicians, I'm assuming you're a musician, uh, or us aspiring creative coders, it's fairly simple. It's PFFT is going to receive an audio input and it's going to perform fast Fourier transform on it, as in it is going to take the collection of samples and it's going to figure out the frequency domain of that sound. So which frequencies are present? How strong are the present frequencies? And what are their phase? We are going to record that information and we are going to reconstruct that sound by using an inverse fast Fourier transform, which is also managed by the PFFT tilde object. Now, this all means that we need to incorporate a few more arguments. So if I go back to the help file, you can see I need to input the FFT size. Uh, which uh, specifies the FFT size in samples of the overlapped windows, which are transformed to and from the spectral domain by the FFT slash IFFT. The window size must be a power of two, that's important, and it defaults to 512. All right, so uh, this is going to be our FFT size, right? So this is going to be how many samples are going to be processed together. 
which means I can simply put 512 in here. Uh, but I need to be careful because if this number is too low, well, the processing is going to be faster, but the quality of the analysis is going to be much, much less. So if I'm reconstructing an analysis that results from a very small FFT window, well, I'm going to get very low quality sound because it's not going to be able to differentiate between the different frequencies because it doesn't have a lot of place for that kind of calculation. But if this number is much higher then what is going to happen is that it's going to take a bit longer for this process to happen, which means a bit of latency, a bit of delay if you are working in a live environment or with other audio sources. But for me currently 512 is perfect. And secondly, let me go back yet again into the help file, I need to input an overlap factor, also called a hop size, I believe. Uh, so this third argument determines the overlap factor for FFD analysis and resynthesis windows. The hop size, so the number of samples between each successive FFD window of fast Fourier transforms performed is equal to the size of the fast Fourier transform divided by this overlap factor. But I am actually just concerned about the final sentence here. A value of 4 is recommended for most, most applications. This is again something you can play around with. Uh, for now, I'm going to just type in 4 and hope for the best. Okay, so my PFFT patch is set up, my PFFT object with the appropriate arguments are set up. So let's see what we have to do inside this patcher. All right, so there is a special object that deals with the audio input into a PFFT sub patch, which is called FFT in tilde. It just needs as an argument which inlet is going to be. It starts counting from one. So FFT in tilde one is going to make the first inlet of my PFFT object uh, taken an audio signal, perform the fast Fourier transform and give me all that uh, complicated real input one and imaginary input one and bin FFT bin index from its outlets. We are in a bit going to see what is going to happen when uh, this value comes out and what we can do with it. But I also want to create a few other inlets. And to create regular inlets as an in inlet that will receive numbers or symbols or lists, I can just create the object in. So in and as an argument two. This is going to be the second inlet of my PFFT object. And let's also create a third one. I'm going to be using the second one probably as a recording toggle, so zero or one, that will decide, that will uh, determine if the incoming audio signal and the FFT analysis will be recorded into our imaginary buffer. And in three, I am going to use it as the, let's say, the size of our buffer, the size of our spectral recording. So for how long, for how many milliseconds or for how many samples or for how many spectral frames is this recording going to take place? All right, so I'm going to just plug my audio cable here, go back into my PFFT sub patcher and consider what is going to come out of these outlets because real input one and imaginary input one are very nice terms, but they do not mean anything to us musically or in terms of spectral analysis. These are mathematical concepts and they need to be converted by, I believe, car to Paul, so Cartesian to polar coordinate conversion for them to mean something. Right, so if we take the real and imaginary numbers as the uh, Cartesian coordinates, X and Y, and if we convert them to polar coordinates, then we are going to get two audio signals that are representative of the amplitude that is present in the current uh, FFT bin, uh, which represents the frequency or range of frequency that is analyzing. And secondly, the phase, which does not mean much for our analysis, but when we are reconstructing the sound, we also need to be concerned with the phase of the frequency or the frequency bin as it's called. All right, uh, now when we are working with phase, there is something that is traditionally done. It's not entirely necessary, but most people use frame delta tilde to not look at the phase, but the differences between the successive instances of phase. So if my phase is zero and the next time it's 0.2, then the delta, the difference is 0.2. Then if I go up one more, I go to 0.3, then the difference is 
0.1. So this is the information I want to keep. And this is the information I later want to use when I reconstruct this analysis or parts of this analysis. But since uh, these values are supposed to be between minus pi and pi, what I can do is, uh, I believe, frame wrap, or what was it called? Delta wrap, or was it called phase wrap? There we go. S wrap a signal between pi and minus pi. So this data has to go through phase wrap. And this is going to be the delta of the phase of my FFT analysis. And again, to the left, I'm going to have the amplitude of the current frequency or the current frequency bin of my FFT analysis. So these two are the information I want to save inside my buffer. However, inside Inside a buffer, this might work, but I'm going to use instead a jitter matrix, so jit.matrix. Now, you might know that jitter matrices are usually used for visual data or data that are related to visual, such as positions of 3D shapes, etc. But as you might know, these are just numbers, these are just values, so I can create a jitter matrix, I can give it a name, that I'm just going to call it HG recording, or HG, uh, yeah, HG recording. And I'm also going to give it a few more arguments because I know each cell needs two values, right? It needs the amplitudes and it needs the phase. So this cell or each cell needs to have two plates. The data type should be flow 32 and the dimensions of the matrix is something we have to consider. Now, for now, I'm going to leave this at, let's say 10 by 10, but this is going to change. To show this, I can use uh, jit. Uh, cell block, right? So if I send a bang to this jitter matrix, you will see that jit cell block kind of visualizes each cell here. And this abstract visualization is a good way to show what I mean by me or us having to change the dimensions of this jitter matrix. Now, what I want is to have an arbitrary number of these analyses one after the other. So each time the audio comes into my FFD and object. Each time the fast Fourier transform is performed onto the window of samples that I have determined, I want those to be placed in the single column here in my uh, jitter matrix. So from top to bottom on the vertical axis, uh, the different frequency values are going to be written. And once that is done, so once the next batch of samples go in uh, FFD in or inside my PFFD patcher, well, I want to move on to the next cell, the next column. So I want to take a step further on my x-axis, on my horizontal axis. And again, I want to write the same values, so on and so on and so on. And the x-axis or the, uh, the width of my jitter matrix then can be arbitrary. That is going to be how long the recording of my spectral frames or my spectral analysis is going to be. But the y-axis, so the height of my jitter matrix, has to be a fixed amount. It has to be the amount of frequency bins that are present in my FFT analysis, which again might change depending on the second argument of PFFT. So I do want to make this modular. I want to make it so if I give PFFT a different value, a value other than 512, I want my patcher to still work. So I'm going to use FFT info tilde, which is going to report information about a patcher loaded by PFFT. I don't even need to trigger this information. The moment the audio context is on or the moment my PFFT patcher is loaded, FFT info is going to report the FFT frame size, it's going to report the spectral frame size, which is the value I need. Then it's going to report the FFT hop size, and then it's going to report if the full spectrum flag is on or not off. Now, these are not relevant to us. The only thing that is relevant to us is the spectral frame size. So that's the amount of different spectral frames that are present in our FFT analysis through the given arguments to PFFT tilde. Which means this value should be the height of my jitter matrix, right? This should be the vert amount of vertical cells present in my two-dimensional jitter matrix. To dynamically set the dimensions of a jitter matrix, I can pack the message dim and then two values. And by default, let's uh, make it 1000, 1000 by 1000. The first value is the width, so the x-axis, and the second value is the height, as in the y-axis. 
Right, so the height is going to be our spectral frame size, so I can simply do this. And again, when I load my PFFD patcher, this should work. Now, for the width, this should be an arbitrary number. A again, this is the length of, I mean, the width of our jitter matrix. So this is for how long the spectral analysis is going to be recorded into our jitter matrix. And I want to determine this through in two. So whatever I send into my PFFT here, that is going to determine that. Let me just find my way back to my patcher. There we go. All right. So uh, I can already save this and I can already just double click on it, press space, press enter, and it's loaded again. As you can see, now it has the second and third inlets. And I can consider how I am going to take this information, take these audio signals and record it into my jitter matrix that I've named HG recording. Now for this, I'm going to be using jit.poke. Jit.poke is going to take an audio signal and write it into a jitter matrix. But of course, on its own, jitpoke is not going to work very well because we need to give it a few arguments. The name of the matrix in which we are going to write this information, how many dimensions are present in that matrix, or matrix is two dimensional, so it's 1000 by 500, or is it, it's 10 by 10, so it's two dimensional, and which plane in the cell that I'm going to write to, uh, this of course begins from zero. So in my case, the name of my matrix is HG recording. Uh, it has two, uh, it is two dimensional. So there are two dimensions and I'm going to be writing in the plane, the first plane, which has the index number of zero because when we are thinking of planes and jitter matrices, we start from counting from zero. All right, so then the first plane is going to com contain, let's say the amplitude info for each frequency bin. And I'm just going to copy this and I'm going to give the second argument, uh, the third argument, the value one, not one comma, just good old one. And that is going to be the second plane of the cell and that's going to contain this phase wrap information. So the phase delta of my FFD analysis. Of course, I need to tell it some other things too. So these other inlets uh, are going to act as the coordinates for uh, the recording into the JIT matrix I'm doing. So to poke into this jitter matrix, I need to tell the X and Y coordinates of the cell in which I'm going to write these audio signals. Now for the Y axis, so for the third inlet of both of these objects, it's fairly simple. I simply need to use the third outlet of FFD in because as I've said, the first outlet is the real input one, the second one is imaginary input one, the third outlet is the FFD bin index. So in this uh, possible FFD frequency bins, which one is uh, being reported. So this is going to coincide exactly with the Y coordinate of our jitter matrix. So I can simply put it here. The X coordinate is a bit more tricky though, because well, I want to kind of increment the X value or the X coordinate each time I am looking at a different FFT window. So to do this, I need to use counter, right? Or apologies, count tilde, which is going to count the samples elapsed. Now, this is a bit different than our good old counter, which we used to just count using bangs and integer numbers. Well, count tilde is going to count the samples elapsed. And it needs a few values, right? It needs the initial value, so that's going to be zero. The count limits for now, this is going to be 1000, but this should equal to the width of our jitter matrix, or maybe some other value we're going to see. Enable is going to be one. I just want this to be enabled without me having to toggle it on. And auto reset state is also going to be one, as in the auto reset is on, meaning if I turn the audio context off and back on, this count is going to start from scratch. It's going to start from zero. Now, the first inlet is going to uh, be either an integer or a bang to start and stop the count. This is not something we need, but I do want to focus on this second inlet of count tilde because any integer value that goes into the second inlet is going to set the count limits. And right now this is 1000. But in fact, if we want to increment, uh, you know, each FFT window that is that gets processed by our sub patch here, 
we need to take the width of our jitter matrix and we need to multiply it by the spectral frame size, right? And that is going to give us the amount of spectral frames that are going to be present in the entirety of our spectral recording. So all the, uh, the amount of all the cells in this jitter matrix. And how do we do this? Well, I can create another FFT info here and I just need to multiply the spectral frame size by the width of the matrix, which is already a value I get through this in two. So I'm just going to use multiplication. And there we go, just multiply these two values. The one thing to watch out is the fact that if I change the width of my jitter matrix, this value is going to update, but this per uh, the calculation will not take place because this value goes into the cold inlet. So I can just use trigger, so T, B, I, as in if this integer number goes in here, first send the integer number this way, and then send the bank to the first inlet of FFD info, which should trigger the calculation. I think this is also stated in the, yep, there we go, report info, info also report when DAC is turned on, so I can just send a bank here, which is going to send this data again, and then the calculation is going to happen one more time and that value is going to go into the second inlet of count. All right, cool. And then since this is going to count from zero until you know the total amount of FFD bins present in the entirety of my spectral profile recording, I can divide this, divide tilde because I'm dividing an audio signal. I can divide this by the spectral frame size which is then going to increment each time the spectral frame size uh, passes a threshold. So each time, simply put, each time I increment on the x-axis, this count is going to increment with it. So this is a not so simple, but a fairly easy way of getting the x-coordinate of the jitter matrix to which we want to record. And at this stage, we are not going to hear anything, but I do want to check if this jitter matrix does produce something. And how I can do this is, well, I can create an outlet. So out one, and this is going to be a regular outlet. So it's going to send out jitter matrices or numbers, but it's not going to send out audio signals. And I can send a bank to this jitter matrix to report the value uh, or the matrix it currently contains. And maybe for this, I can use the third inlet. So let's delete this, let's save our patch, let's go to the main patcher, reload this PFFT. And as you can see, now it has an outlet and we can visualize this by using jit.p window, which is going to visually represent the incoming jitter matrix. All right, so the second one, the second message was the length. This is thousand by default, but maybe I can change it in a second. And the third inlet is going to be uh, yeah, it just needs to receive a bank to show the contents of the jitter matrix, it's going to trigger the output of the jitter matrix inside my PFFT patcher. So I'm going to turn this on, I'm going to play the audio, and I'm going to click this button a bunch of times. Let's see. Okay, there we go. So we are getting something. It kind of starts from here for some reason. That might have to do with the speed at which I'm clicking, so to make sure everything is all right, I'm going to create Metro. Let's give it the argument 33. So I'm going to send a bunch of banks to my PFFT patcher. All right, so it seems to be starting at a different level. But if I change, there we go, if I change this value, then it's working. So if I change the second inlet's value, so you can see now I'm recording all this information. In this case, since this is a two dimensional matrix, green means the first plane, so that is the amplitude of the uh, different audio signals and the purple or pink or whatever that color is to you is going to be the phase of the audio signal. To make this visualization a bit nicer, I can also use jit.unpack2 to just target the first plane. And since we usually perceive this upside down as in we perceive the lowest frequency as the, you know, the lowest cell or the lowest line in the visualization, we can also use jit.dimmap at dim or 
uh, not them, what was it, at invert 0, 1. So just flip it on the y-axis and there we go. I can even make the size, the width of my jitter matrix a bit higher. And here we have a nice visualization of the spectrum. Now, before we go further, I do want to do one more thing here. Let me turn off the audio processing. Uh, because I want to make this toggleable. I don't want this to continue on for, well, forever. So I'm going to create a selector object. So selector tilde. And I'm going to give the selector two inputs, right? So either process the either send out the incoming data or just send out a dummy signal as in let's say sig tilde minus one or send a value of minus one right and i want to make it uh, so either all of these signals are passed along or all of these inlets just receive minus one as in there is nothing written into my jitter matrix and to control this maybe i can create yet another inlet so this can be in four and this can be my on off toggle, which is going to be zero or one. In this case, though, I want it to be one or two. So I'm going to add one plus one to the value incoming from N4. There we go. All right, so if my toggle is off, which means if it's zero, I add one to it, so it's one. And the second inlet of my selector is going to come out of the outlet. So that's going to be my dummy signal, right? Because the toggle is off. However, if my toggle is indeed on, then it's going to have one added to it. It's going to be two. Then the whatever uh, the third inlet is receiving is going to come out of this outlet. And in this case, I want this to be the signal that I want to write into my jits.poke and eventually my jitter matrix. Now, uh, I have to go into the spaghetti realm here, meaning that I have to create a bunch of these guys, a bunch of these selectors. In fact, I need to create three of these per JIT poke. So I'm going to do it a bit dirty right now to save some time. But when you make this patch or when you work with these kinds of patches, I'm sure you can clean out the patch. So months later or weeks later or years later, you do not become very upset at what you have done and sit in a corner and think about what you have done. All right, in any case, uh, so this is going to be this value. This then the x-axis is going to be the second selector and the y-axis or the y-coordinates is going to be the third selector. And all the selectors are going to get this minus one signal if our toggle is off. Okay, looks horrible, but this should work. So let's see if this does indeed work. Uh, I'm first going to save this patch, going to recreate my PFFT object. There we go. Now it has a fort inlet, which we can use as a general on off toggle. And right now it is off. I'm going to turn on the audio. I'm going to play the audio and see, even if I have the Metro one, there is nothing being recorded. But if I toggle this on, I also don't have anything recorded Ah, because I need to change this value. I guess later I should set an initial value in my PFFD patcher. Right now I'm not going to worry about it. I'm just going to change this value. If I toggle it off, there we go. There's nothing. If I toggle it back on, we continue writing into our matrix. Fantastic. All right, well, so far so good. We have recorded the spectral profile of the sound into a jitter matrix, I might add, into a JIT matrix which is great. So this is done. So, but now I want to play the spectral profile back. And for this, I'm going to use a second PFFT patcher. So I'm going to not use this PFF, uh, this FFT patcher I already have saved and used. I'm going to create a new one for playback purposes. All right, let's see. So I need to create a new patcher, right? And without doing anything with the empty patcher, I'm just going to save it as HG underscore FFT playback. Then I can simply create a new PFFT object, give it the initial argument HG FFT, uh, what was it, playback, FFT playback, and then the same second and third argument, so 5, 12, and 4. And if I open this again, we have our currently empty PFFT patcher. 
All right, so what do I need here? Well, first of all, I need to receive this jitter matrix, right? Because I'm going to take this jitter matrix and I'm going to look into that for, you know, the phase and the amplitude and the frequency bins and all that information. So I'm going to create a few inlets. So let's use in one and in two and even in three. All right, so one of these is going to receive the jitter matrix. But then I also need some kind of playback indication, right? So a value that tells me at which point, uh, so which point in this jitter matrix should this PFFT subpatcher playback. And I want to use a normalized value for this, right? So I want to input a value between uh, 0 and 1, and 0 would equal to the beginning of the spectral analysis, and the value 1 would equal to the end of the spectral analysis. Now, if I'm sending that kind of value into PFFT, this should be by the means of a signal because we are going to read a jitter matrix as an audio signal and the objects that deal with this require an audio signal input. So let's create a floating point number box and sig tilde to convert this value into an audio signal. And of course, these in one, in two, in threes are not going to understand the incoming audio signal because if we are sending audio to a PFFT subpatcher, we have to use FFT in. FFT in for FFT in one. The only problem is by default, FFT in is going to receive the audio signal and it's going to try to apply a fast Fourier transform on the signal, which is not what we want in this case. We just want this value, so something between 0 and 1, to be passed into our PFFT subpatcher. And a very easy way of doing this is giving it the argument no FFT, right? That is the window envelope function. There are a lot of different uh, FFT window envelope functions, but right now we are just worried about not using fast Fourier transform as the data is coming in. And you can see in the reference, kind of tiny, but if the symbol no FFT is used, then the FFT in object will not use a windowing envelope and will not perform a fast Fourier transform. It will echo the first half of its input sample window to its real output and the second half of its input sample window to its imaginary output. For us, that's not important. It just means that the first outlet is going to send the value that PFFT receives via this audio signal. Great. All right, so let's do it like this. FFT1 is going to receive the playback position. Uh, in 2 is going to receive the matrix from which I want the playback. So I'm going to create a new jitter matrix, and I'm just going to give it a name. Let's call it playback. All right, and I just want whatever comes from in 2 to go into the first inlet of my JIT matrix playback. So how is this going to look? Well, let me recreate this. I'm just going to take this jitter matrix, and I'm just going to plug it into the second inlet of this PFFT object. Then this is going to be loaded into JIT matrix that I have named playback. All right, cool. So how do we read back from this? Well, just like JIT poke, we also have a JIT.peak tilde, which is going to read matrix data, so jitter matrix data, as an audio signal. And just like before, it just needs the same kind of argument. So the name of the jitter matrix from which is going to playback, and yeah, I named this appropriately, playback. Um, it's uh, how many dimensions does it have? It's going to have two dimensions. And again, I'm going to have one version where it reads from the first plane and another another version where it reads from the second plane. The first plane is, has the index of zero. The second plane has the index of one. All right, now this object has two inlets because it does not need a value to write into the matrix. It just needs the coordinates from which to read the matrix, read the cells of this matrix. And just like before, the Y coordinate is very easy. We just use the third outlet of FFT and tilde, which is the FFT bin index. So this should work out very nicely, but we need to do a bit of calculation to figure out the X coordinate because we want to normalize this, right? As in the value coming out from FFT in one is going to be a value between zero and one. And we want to multiply this with the length of or so the, sorry, the width or the length of our jitter matrix. So multiply tilde. And then how can we get this? Well, let's just use this third inlet for that purpose. So whatever the third inlet contains, just multiply the incoming uh, normalized value with that. So we kind of scale or normalize coordinates into 
the width of our jitter matrix. And by default, I'm also going to make this 1000. There we go. And that value is going to be the X coordinates. And again, I'm just going to refresh this PFFD patcher and I'm going to make sure the width of my jitter matrix also goes into here. Once again, this is turning into a spaghetti patch little by little, but this is something we can clean up afterwards. So I'm just going to go back in here and I'm going to think, okay, how do I deal with the values I receive from here? So the first plane contains the amplitudes of the frequency bits, which is perfect. The second, uh, the second plane contains the phase of the uh, frequency bins, which are, you know, is the result of our analysis. So I just need to put these together. So I'm just going to inverse of what I have done in my original FFT record PFFT sub patcher, which was car to pole, Cartesian coordinates to polar coordinates. Well, then in this case, I just need to convert the polar coordinates to Cartesian coordinates, which are going to, which is going to give me the real and imaginary numbers of the uh, FFT analysis readback. And then to turn this back into a nice, neat little audio signal, I can just use FFT in's brother or sister or sibling FFT out tilde one. And FFT out is going to require two values. The first, the real output one of the patcher, which is this, and the imaginary output one of the patcher, which is that. And this, well, should work. I hope so, I hope it's going to work. So let's refresh this again. As you can see now, PFFD has an outlet and I can use live gain. It's already giving me something which is interesting. Let's just uh, refresh everything. Let's also make sure this goes through Lemmy. Because again, you know, if we mess something up, we don't want our speakers to blow up. And well, let's start recording. Let's do this. Okay, now this is playing, I have the sound off, so you're not going to be hearing anything, but I'm going to trigger the playback, I mean the record, recording uh, of my PFFT sub patcher now. Okay, so this is a horrible sound, but I believe this is the very first frame of our analysis. Hmm, interesting. This does not seem to be the right analysis. This does make a really nice sound, but I think we have a problem here. Ah, and I know what the problem is. All right, if I if we look into our record patcher, you can see that we did something to the face. We did not just pass it or uh, record it into our jitter matrix, but we used frame delta to get the delta of the face, and then we used phase wrap to wrap it between minus pi and one, uh, minus pi and pi, which means if we go into our playback, we cannot just read the phase and be done with it because what this gives out is not the phase but the phase delta so i just need to use frame acum tilde which is going to get us uh, the running phase of the successive phase deltas or the phase distances which means it's going to give us the right phase which then gets converted into the real and imaginary outputs which then is converted into a regular audio signal let's see if my theories are correct Yes, this is exactly what I wanted. Now, you can see if I cycle through the available uh, frequencies, it kind of plays the sound back. But the advantage of this is first, I can really pinpoint a certain location and look at the frequencies there, use it for some kind of soundscape or some other musical idea. So I can really go through the different frequencies. And secondly, I can just play this back and, you know, back and forth, and I do not change the pitch while I'm playing it back because I'm not using groove or some kind of buffer playback at different speeds. No, I'm really reconstructing the sound itself through my spectral analysis. So let's try another sound. Let's, uh, I don't know, I'm just going to load randomly. Let's do Volking Bass. Let's start recording. All 
right, and now let's see. Whoops, I forgot to, <laughs> I forgot to, uh, you know, stop the recording. So now it's kind of recording the non-existing audio. So let's do this again. All right, and then I'm going to stop the recording. All right, recording has stopped. Music has stopped. The frequencies and the FFE analysis is still here. So. Now I can look at the different frequencies present in my analysis. I can even play it back and get all kinds of cool soundscapes. And a fun way to spice these sounds up, by the way, is to just use some reverb. I'm going to use a free uh, Valhalla Supermassive reverb that I have already downloaded in order to see what comes out when I take these sounds and I apply a bit of reverb onto them. So let's use some large reverb, let's turn down the mix a bit, and let's see what happens. Now look at that, we are getting some really nice soundscapes. Okay, I'm enjoying this so much, so I'm just going to try this again with a final uh, audio file. Let's use, I don't know, let's use um, piano, vs underscore piano underscore loop. All right, and if we play this back, we get this beautiful sound. Okay, I can play around with this forever, so I'm just going to stop it here, but here we go. So we have taken an audio file, we have performed a fast Fourier transform and an inverse fast Fourier transform in order to boil the sound down into spectral components and then build it back according to certain indices that we have set ourselves uh, through these normalized coordinates. Which means that you can take this and you can create all kinds of soundscapes or virtual instruments or any kind of compositional, musical or performative idea really. A good idea is to couple this with my previous video on taking an FFT transform and visualizing it using JIT GL objects. But in any case, I'm sure you're going to create some really fun, interesting, cool things with it. And thank you for watching.